everyone. We've added this note to the beginning of all of our original episodes of the podcast to let you know of a few changes that have happened around here and hopefully avoid any confusion for you as listeners. When we began this podcast, it was called Starseed Survival Guide, and most people called me, your host, by my birth name, Erin. Throughout the first 22 episodes, you'll hear me introduce myself as Erin, hear others refer to me as Erin, and hear many references to the name of the show being Starseed Survival Guide. In 2018, more and more folks began calling us Yaya, and in March of 2020, we changed the name of this podcast to Earthside Survival Guide to more accurately reflect our intentions for the show. For a little more of the full story of what these changes mean to us, please check out episode 23, a temple talk where we reflect on where we've been, where we are now, and where we're going. We thank you for your patience during this transition, for listening and sharing this journey with us, and most importantly, for allowing us to continue to grow and evolve. Blessings. Welcome to the second half of our two-part interview with author, teacher, and matriarchal foremother Vicki Noble. We're just going to pick right up where we left off, speaking about one of my favorite subjects, goddess in her collective form. So, back to the <laughs> the women's collectives, because I'm so I'm just so interested in this. Um, one of my favorite concepts that you've contributed to the larger dialogue around women's empowerment is your suggestion that women form legally binding, supportive, child-rearing collectives in an huh. honest acknowledgement of the reality that historically men have tended to come and go. Yes, very well said. Thank you. <laughs> so I love this suggestion because I hear so like endless enumeration of what's not working uh -huh. in the nuclear family paradigm in romantic. Um, dyads of all genders, um, but very rarely hear anyone offering any solutions whatsoever or any alternatives. I think for me, the idea came uh, as a natural result of the integration I was speaking of earlier with, with the matriarchal studies uh, movement and, and our own feminist movement. Um, you know, in California, I think the statistics are even worse than you've said. I believe it's 75% failure of the whole nuclear family fantasy. So uh, we, I, I feel uh, like that was an outcome, actually, of the revolution of the 60s and 70s, and that in some way we did break that form, and it's broken now. And it's very sad for people who are trying to keep it going uh, because so few are able to do it in a really successful way. So my, uh, that teaching that you're, you're bringing up, I guess that was from Laura, I, I, to I told that to my students uh, when I was teaching in the university for two decades. And what I kept uh, seeing and hearing from my students, especially the ones who were between 30 and 40 years old, which was the majority. Um, they were, they seemed desperate to find Mr. Right so that they could have babies and do it in a good way. And I said over and over again in my public talks during, the, during that time that I was teaching um, that that's not working. The fantasy isn't working. It's terribly disappointing to have the fantasy find the guy and it doesn't work out or to be so desperate to find the guy that you scare him away the minute you get within his vibration. You know, it's just, it's a terrible uh, thing to think that that's your destiny. I don't believe that. I believe children are kind of on one side and relationships are on another side and they're very wonderful if you want them. Uh, but your destiny is in front of you and it's not either one of those it's uh your contribution it's who am i what am i doing here so i was uh very disturbed 
by this tendency, this trend, to be looking so hard for the right guy to make the thing happen. And I said to the women, very honestly, you know, move in a house together, get a, make a legal contract so you won't, you know, you won't betray each other, and, and have your babies, and raise the children together for 10 years or 15 years or whatever, and let the men come and go, because that's what they do anyway and make it okay. And I, I did that. That came out of directly out of my studies of matriarchal cultures. Because in matriarchal cultures, there's frequently not even an institution of marriage. For instance, the Moso in China have no institution of marriage. They have no institution of biological fatherhood. It's not a social institution. Even though they often know who the father is, it doesn't matter. The brother raises the children in the household, you know, with the sisters. So, um, so out of that, uh, out of knowing that in matriarchal culture, people don't, uh, they don't mythologize the romantic relationship between a man and a woman, even if they have children together. They don't mythologize it. They, the, if there's a mythology in the, in the matriarchal system, it's the mother and her brother who are the, the social parents of the children. Um, and I felt like that's so legitimate. You know, we all, we know where our babies come from. They come from inside of us. <laughs> we don't always know uh, where the, sperm came from that made the baby you know you might know you might have one partner but you might have many in in matriarchal cultures in one of the cultures maybe it was the most so i read that they have a word for a woman with one friend and they have a word for a woman with many friends hmm. and they don't care because it's not uh, economically based in any way so they don't make economic alliances around a husband and a wife and their roles you know they their economy is comes from the mother's household and the boys and men who visit their female lovers at night go back home to the mother's household where their productive labor is part of her economy mm. is part of the matriarchal clan structure mm. economy so i was just thinking well why can't we implement something like that. We can't do it the way it's actually done in an intact matriarchal culture, but we could begin to prioritize the, the bonding and connection between women who want to be mothers and the raising of children, which in many indigenous cultures is done by many mothers, not one mother in an isolated household with little children. That's crazy making, you know? <laughs> It really is. Yes. The, the privacy of the nuclear family, I think, really can be like a breeding ground for our worst tendencies. Uh -huh. In my experience, um, I really love the accountability of having many adults around uh, that, it, that hold me accountable to my higher values and my, my higher self. That really works for me as a practice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, you know, the children benefit from having many parents from having the community of people who love them. I think for me, part of the the it's more than interest and it's more than passion. It's like I have to admit it's a real need to see a variety of relationship paradigms begin to gain respect and momentum and flourish in contemporary culture. because. I actually, you know, you're talking about like the institution of certain aspects of relationship, but I actually feel like like romance as the celebrated gateway into love or um, celebrated experience or flavor of love is very oppressive to all of the other flavors of love that we can experience with people. And I've, it's taken me so long, like, 17 years to really realize that friendship is real for me in a way that romance isn't real for me mm. and 
to allow myself to experience all manners of, of intimacy within the container of friendship. And there's something that happens with just time where people just don't have a lot of time. And so there, I see people continually prioritizing the pursuit of the romantic relationship. Again, I, I believe because they want children and they think that you have to have a monogamous romantic relationship to have children. But the, then there's a, another aspect of why that's damaging where I feel like it causes people to kind of ignore or abandon all these other support um, relationships in their life and let those bonds kind of wither because they're like, well, everybody knows like I'm getting married and having a baby. So everything is for that now. And then when that doesn't work out, people are just in a free fall because they've let their entire support network shrivel. Yes. Um, I think that, I think that's very radical of you, dear. That's really, <laughs> that is a very good new beginning. That's powerful. Oh, I must say I've been a sucker for romance my whole life. So I don't know that we're going to probably get rid of that anytime soon. But we can get rid of the forms, you know, we can create alternative forms and other other ways. And also when the form dies, uh, when my marriage to my son's father uh, died or was impossible to continue, um, we broke that form. But we love each other very much and and never have left off of that love and respect that we feel for one another. We're soulmates. And I have many soulmates in my life, and I love them all still. And I think that there's nothing, nothing wrong with forms coming and going. You know, we enter and leave forms. Forms are just forms. Yeah. The, the energy behind it, the integrity, the, the love, the deep ways that we can be intimate uh, in, in different ways with different people. It's beautiful. And a lot of people don't know about that. So that's a radical teaching. Gosh, <laughs> whenever anyone says that, I'm like, oh God, no, I don't, I don't want it to be radical. I want it to be happening yesterday. I want it to be born into that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think that sometimes I get, I get worried about coming across as being like down with monogamy or down with romance, but it really is just wanting to see a great variety of paradigms that people feel totally empowered to choose from whichever one sounds um, the best to them right now at this yeah. time for these yeah. life circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so celebration of friendship, love, celebration of the priest priestess relationship as something that is not a romance. Like and, monks and nuns, you mean? Um, well, yeah, that's another, that would be another one. <laughs> um, like it, monks and, and nuns and their co habitation in service to their mutual connection to a higher purpose or philosophy, but even to, it, I guess what happens in my life is that I meet men and it's very easy to go into a romantic thing with them and feel this is that, and it's not that. And it, it devolves so rapidly and painfully when you try to make it that, but yes. because it's actually meant to be like two individuals in a, um, a reciprocal sexual energy exchange that's not about procreation and not about creating something for the individuals. Like it's about like uh, like a a like a, a practice dyad that is in service to a shared sense of divinity together. And just how close it can feel to the romantic paradigm, and how how um... because it's mythological. Mm -hmm. It's still mythological. It's tantra that you're describing, don't you think? Yes. But it's, uh, it's not about uh, patriarchal marriage. Yeah. So I guess we're still in a patriarchal culture, so it's not easy to. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's all theory until we get inside of it and and uh, start living it. And as my uh, ex-husband and I came to understand, we, we felt we had tried to, we had taken Shakti and Shiva, and we had uh, tried to 
pull them into the form of Zeus and Hera. Yes. <laughs> and it didn't work. <laughs> you so perfectly articulate and clearly articulated what it, the sort of thing that I was trying to get at is like it's a dilemma. <laughs> yeah. The, the, it, it's, I think something that's, that is really, uh, we're really facing right now is being asked to live it from that subtlety that can articulate the difference and can let the the Shiva and Shakti relationship be what it is and not trying to get, you know, the wild wandering Shiva to give you babies and then like let the <laughs> Zeus Hera be what it is and not try to get the like ruler of the lands and a uh, person holding down their whole kingdom to want to take off for three years into the mythic inner realms with you just let the let relationships be what they are yeah, yeah. <laughs> blessed be <laughs> i was just so happy and delighted to be able to have this conversation with you who has been like you said taking it out of the realm of theory and really living living in a liberated way for Decades upon decades. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> so, you know, we've been talking about what it feels to me to be a renewed wave of interest in activism uh, because of what we're seeing happen in our government at this time. And this is taken the form in my life of wanting to educate myself on the history of feminist movements in the United States. And that's what had led me to read Shakti Woman, having never read it before. And now I think that was published in 1991. So like my math's pretty bad, but I think that makes it 26 years old. Is that <laughs> accurate? Right. <laughs> so that was like almost disturbing to me to to realize when I finished the book and was like, wait, when was this written? Because the call to action at the end of the book felt so excruciatingly relevant yeah. to this moment. And um, so I'd love to read that paragraph that really kind of like stunned me uh, for anyone that's listening that hasn't read this particular text. So this is really the last paragraph of the book. But for a woman in our time to hold her ground is a most difficult task. People seem to want to distort her knowledge into something familiar and manageable. They clamor to fit it into existing frameworks. For a woman to hold her instincts, her gut feelings, and her inner voice is an enormous task. The goal is to make ourselves strong enough to be leaders, healers, and teachers in this time. We must create a strong enough central axis that each of us can stand her ground in the face of all opposition, visible or invisible, that might attempt to stop the expulsion of the possessing entity who has taken over the world. A process of embodiment is taking place wherein women and men, without any particular education for it, become willing vessels of the vision. The women who perform this function I call Shakti women, Shakti meaning to be able, and referring to the power of the feminine force of creative instinctual becoming. We are giving form and expression to the return of the goddess through a global recovery movement that is a modern day equivalent of a shamanic healing crisis. <sighs> <laughs> yes, aren't we? <laughs> You know, I was, uh, I was talking, I was using some of uh, the language of Mary Daly in that, uh, in that particular section, talking about the patriarchal possessing entity that came into this planet at some point. And uh, I like very much her way of talking about uh, falling out of the patriarchal foreground and falling into the matriarchal background mm. and in that way finding remembering remembering putting ourselves back together mm. <sighs> thank you so my question that i had originally thought to be a last question here was around 
just wondering, since God, that's almost three decades old, and you've been continued to live these ways, what, how your understanding of this patriarchal possessing entity and global healing crisis may have evolved or shifted as a result of your experiences since you first wrote those words? Uh huh. Well, I guess it's sort of like uh, experiences that healers uh, have to face uh, on a regular basis, which is that the efforts uh, you made toward the healing, I'm thinking of a hands-on healing session, let's say with someone who has a disease or some uh, physical issue. Oftentimes you can put hands-on, especially in a group context, and the, the disease issue will actually spontaneously disappear or back off or go into remission. Um, which is very gratifying, of course, for a healer. But there are those intractable moments in healing where you can't seem to, no matter what effort you put out, you can't seem to shake loose the problem or overcome the, the obstacle. And I feel like that's where we are now. There's some way that in the 1970s, I believed, as so many of my contemporaries did, that we would change everything. We would change everything. We would, you know, we knew at that time the dangers of the pollution and the oil extraction and the plastics and the, all the different toxins and everything. We knew it all. We knew that climate was going to be uh, negatively affected if we continued in the same direction. And we believed fervently, fiercely, that we were changing all of that. And my despair at, in the early 2000s, when I left the urban center of the Bay Area and moved to the woods and began to do Tibetan Buddhist Dakini practices uh, in a life or death way. Um, my despair at that point was very deep, and it was a despair for the whole collective. I felt, oh no, we're not, we're not doing what we needed to do. I can't really believe it, but we're not. As a collective, we're just not doing it. We've been seduced by the gold ring, you know. We've been seduced by what capitalist patriarchy offers up. It always takes our rhetoric and our dilemmas and it turns them around and makes them, you know, makes some capitalist solution uh, attractive to us, and, and we go for it. And I, and I just can't help but feel that that in some way is what happened for us as a movement, and we try to be, you know, be able to, to integrate into the, the, the market society, the global market, the free market. And, and we try to do that with our spiritual work. We all do. It's offered up, you know. Publishing only wants uh, for us to do that. Everybody wants for us to do that. So it's almost impossible not to. I have a, a lot of sympathy, no judgment. But I went into a very deep despair and actually had a session finally with ayahuasca where I said, what am I to do? What, what am I to do as a spiritual teacher and healer? What do I say, you know, if this is how I feel? And the plant said to me, there's nothing to do but alleviate suffering. Mm. And I felt so uh, integrated in that moment, like, oh, okay. Well, that's what I do. That's my business. <laughs> that's my path. So I'll just keep doing that. And uh, but I did decide at, at a certain point that we women in our spirituality need a method. We need methods. We aren't uh, that beautiful thing that happens when we come together and our hearts join. It's, it's one aspect of what is needed. But it's not, uh, it's not intelligent enough on its own to help us overcome our addictions and our compulsions and all of those things that get in our way. And so we need method. 
And that's when I began to adapt Tibetan Buddhist Dakini practices for my goddess women students. I felt we needed something that is, uh, is disciplined and not a formula, but a structure in which we can immerse ourselves and we can find that very strong central axis that is so necessary if we're not going to cave in to all of the sexual stereotypes and all of the seductions of the culture. And so that's what I've been doing since that time. And that's the private work I do with the women who come and study with me. And that's the work I do in my groups now. We just have to go on, you know, we have to go on even in the face of failure. Yeah. Even, even uh, facing the possibility of total systems collapse. It's, uh, it's apparently our karma, you know, and so I think as human beings, we, we learn through karmic trial and error, and this is a big one. Yeah. Um, so um, I suspect that you and your channel for the wisdom that comes through you and your mother piece tarot archetypes are probably all fully merged at this point and probably the, um, you are um, already speaking um, the answer to the question that that I was formulating <laughs> yeah but just to close on the theme of, of mystical activism and mystical practice and its relationship to action in the world I think my, my question for the, the mother piece deck would be, I'm kind of conceptualizing this moment as coming to your temple. We've kind of bended time and space and I've come to your temple and asking you as high priestess to channel or read or however you think of it um, from your deck, the answer to my question that's on behalf of, of my people as I consider my community, that's just what would goddess most like for the women of my community to understand about action and activism and yeah, what's most important for her for us to to know to be both effective and well in our bodies <laughs> that's intense huh the death card The death card actually is my favorite of all the mother piece images. It always has been. Karen made the image, uh, but uh, I love it very much. And for me, it is the, the most important, I suppose, generalized uh, glyph of the goddess religion. It's about cycles. We have to honor the cycles. And what I, what I was saying really is we have to honor even the ending of great cycles. And while that's very uncomfortable and disturbing and kind of frightening for all of us, uh, it is the way that 
it is. We are inside of these cycles. We're inside of a lunar cycle right now. You know, we're inside of a solar cycle of the year. We're inside of uh, much larger cycles, uh, periods of time. And the death card shows us how the forms change, but there's always rebirth. The forms change, something dies, but it's not the essence that dies. It's the form. Forms don't last. And even cultural forms don't last. So, you know, our, our Western culture is uh, pretty old, if we count Europe. Our American culture is, is quite young, uh, except, of course, for Native people who've been here forever. Um, but our Western patriarchal culture, you know, it, it may be it's on its way out. And not only that, in a, you know, I have to uh, at least entertain the possibility that, that, that the human experiment could actually also come to an end. Humanity is just a form. There are bonobos, there are chimps, you know, and there are humans. And who's to say whether any of us will survive this uh, onslaught of destruction that has already taken out so many species. We're not special in that way. We're not immune. And perhaps we haven't, uh, you know, perhaps our destiny isn't what we would have hoped. And we're going to have to actually accept the end of our own existence. I don't know. I, I give uh, all my hope these days goes to Mother Earth and the whole system of our planet and those that we don't understand at all. You know, when, when they announced that Lake Erie was dead a decade ago or whenever that was, from the terrible toxic overload, um, and they stopped pouring toxins into Lake Erie. Then through some magical means that we have no certain understanding of, Lake Erie became alive again and you know, threw off the toxins and regenerated herself. And certainly as a healer, I've seen that over and over again with human bodies. And so I absolutely trust it. And the ayahuasca experience for me was one in which I had to ask myself, or I felt that the universe was asking me, what's so bad about, you know, I, I, you don't mind death in a personal sense. If it comes, it comes. It's part of the cycle. Why be so upset about the larger cycle and the death and rebirth that may be coming? So. You know, that's a lot for us to hold. We need deep spiritual uh, anchors to be able to hold that truth, if that's our truth, mm -hmm. and to face it, uh, you know, with our hearts open. Thank you. It's, it really resonates because that word uncomfortable that you, you selected to bring through in there, it's, it's really on the lips and tongues of so many, you know. Uh, different groups is just being like, yeah, it's a time to be uncomfortable. It's a time yeah. to really go into that discomfort and not not be reaching for your normal devices that make things more cozy. Like it's it's not a time to um, be asleep in that process. Yeah, I agree. Well, twenty years ago, a student asked me. But don't you think uh, that when it becomes an emergency, people will wake up? <laughs> and, and at that time, 20 years ago, I said, what about our situation is not an emergency yeah. right now? And still, we're not responding, you know, yeah. as, a, as an organism. And so I believe that uh, we've kind of gone past the time of that uh, response that would have been so helpful. But it's never too late, of course. Mother Earth has her own capacities. But there's also the, there's also the whole uh, cyclic reality and that things begin and have a middle and have an end. And we may be, we may be incarnated at this moment in time in order to uh, witness that together. I did say in Shakti Woman, I think it's a command performance right now that we are all 
in. All the souls are in. How else could we have so many billions of people on the planet at one time? Hmm. We're all here. <sighs> yeah. Um, well, thank you deeply for just um, just continuing, really, because that that is you mentioned feeling despair. We and we all feel that, and that that's the sort of spirit that comes through to me is just the words that I heard were this is what it feels like to be winning because we're not ever going to stop. So, you know, like there is a group of people with a particular set of understanding about living in harmony with our ecosystem that will never ever stop. Right. They're moving in the direction of that. So, you know, whenever that happens and like you bringing in the perspective of like, and maybe it's not in this lifetime or maybe it's not for humans on this planet, but that force will never die and yes. it will find the place that is hospitable or the group of beings who are capable of grounding and living that and harmony will flourish there and we will be there in the, that moment. Yeah. So we're winning. New, new forms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we have to start wrapping up. I just want to mention, I'll be putting up the link to that Facebook group and you can always contact Vicky there um, about her individual work with women and you can visit matrafocus.com or motherpeacetarot.com and find um, more articles and teachings and stories from Vicky's beautiful universe. And <laughs> a formal thank you to you, Vicky, for your continual contributions to the liberation and celebration of the divine feminine here on earth and to all the benevolent beings and all the realms who've gathered here today with us to inspire and direct the flow of this ritual conversation. We dedicate any merits accumulated through this work to the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be well. May all beings know joy and not suffer. Thank you so much for your generosity today. Yes, thank you for your depth. Jai Ma, amen, namaste, blessed be, why not, aho, may it be finished in beauty. Yes, remember you, we have so much catching up to do. Thank you for moving back, not forgetting about the time, and we're taking the time to make it happen, and we're walking back, and we're just going to turn all the information on the time, and the celebration of the time, showing up with our relationship, showing up with the one of us, and the love of us, and a thousand years, and love drives, and tears, 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 and tears,